this episode of Fly by Night, you'll hear the story of the disappearance of Melanie Flynn of Lexington, Kentucky, a young woman who had come into contact with narcotics officers who had moved over to the other side of the law and created a large aircraft-based drug smuggling operation. And you'll hear the death of a Florida state attorney who was killed because he too had the tragic misfortune of coming up against people who would go to any length to avoid the exposure of their smuggling operation. Former Lexington cop Drew Thornton, his partners Bradley Bryant and Henry Vance, and others in their criminal enterprise had a lot to lose if someone said too much outside the circle of co-conspirators. Or worse, if someone shared their inside knowledge as a way of making a deal to avoid a long prison sentence. Stay tuned for Episode 3 of Fly By Night. In Episode 2, you heard how Lexington Narcotic Squad cops turned smugglers Drew Thornton and Bradley Bryant had grown their organization by flying ever-increasing amounts of drugs into Kentucky. With connections in Columbia made for them by organized crime figure Jimmy Chagra of Las Vegas, they were using large cargo aircraft like DC-3s and DC-4s to bring tons of marijuana into Kentucky. And with the assistance of Harold Brown, the chief of the DEA in the Lexington area at that time, who helped them avoid local law enforcement, they became good at what they were doing. But even before their business grew and they left the police force to make smuggling by aircraft their full-time work, this small group of cops faced the problem that all criminals face when the size of their organization increases. With more people comes a greater risk of someone either mistakenly or intentionally saying something that could lead to an investigation or arrest. It's an old but common story. When fear and paranoia overtake the ability to reason clearly, criminals sometimes resort to violence to solve what they see as a threat. And that's one of the most widely accepted theories of why Melanie Flynn, a young woman from Kentucky, simply disappeared on January 25, 1977, never to be seen again. On that day, she spoke with her father who asked her to drop off some papers when she left her work at the Kentucky High School Athletic Association. She never arrived at her father's home. Eight days later, her car was found at an area apartment building. And in August of that year, a fisherman found her purse in the Kentucky River. In it were medications she took to help with the effects of a serious head injury she had sustained years earlier when she fell off a horse. That led to early speculation that somehow she had traveled from her car to the river, maybe had an accident that led to her drowning, or perhaps she committed suicide. After over 43 years, possible witnesses have died, memories and recollections have become hazy, but the vanishing of Marilyn Flynn still resonates not just with her family, but with newspapers and TV reporters who covered her disappearance then and are now approaching the end of their careers. In fact, even as recently as the summer of 2019, the story of Melanie Flynn was once again on Lexington TV stations, as yet another rumor of where her remains could be found led to heavy equipment being brought in by Kentucky State Police to dig along a Lexington area highway. As was reported then, the new information was the result of the pangs of conscience of someone who was now dying and wanted to unburden themselves of their knowledge of her burial site. But as with all other tips in Melanie's disappearance, this one was just as fruitless. And unless someone comes forward with real information, many years after that last and final casual conversation with her father, it seems likely that in late January of 1977, Melanie Flynn's story would end. Beyond the possibility that she may have committed suicide, The theory that has gained the most currency is that she may have died because the relationship she had with one of Drew Thornton's partners, or Thornton himself, had become a risky one for Melanie Flynn. Numerous accounts of the Times say that Melanie had become an informant for one of the members of the new narcotic squad, and possibly had begun a romantic relationship with the officer. And though stories of this possible relationship began to surface quickly after her disappearance, no one was ever charged and the officer in question has long maintained his innocence. 
The following story is of a death directly caused by a member of the Lexington-based smuggling operation. It is the sad and strange tale of the killing of a Florida state attorney. At home with his wife on the evening of January 16, 1982, Eugene Berry answered his door, and seconds later he lay dying on his floor with his wife trying to comfort and save him. His killer wasn't one of the main players in Drew Thornton's aircraft-based smuggling organization but instead was the wife of one of their crew members. She was a young woman who made the mistake of her life when she volunteered to travel from Kentucky to Florida to take the life of the man who was attempting to either keep her husband in prison for many years or turn him into an informant. When we return, you'll hear the story of Bonnie Kelly, who went from being a small-time criminal to becoming an assassin. Bonnie Kelly was 30 years old when her husband Mike was convicted in Florida of helping to import tons of marijuana. The Kellys were from Kentucky, and Mike Kelly helped with an electronic anti-surveillance operation that allowed Drew Thornton, Bradley Bryant, and Henry Vance to avoid detection by local, state, and federal investigators. Much of Kelly's work for Thornton and the others is lost to history now. But in addition to his electronics work, he was licensed to sell weapons, making him a valuable resource for the Lexington-based smuggling organization. That also meant he possessed incriminating information on the group's activities, including its aviation operations. So when Mike Kelly was caught in an apparently unrelated smuggling by boat bust in Florida and was convicted through the efforts of Assistant State Attorney Eugene Berry, it set off alarm bells back in Kentucky. And it set in motion a chain of events that would result in the death of Eugene Berry, a fast-rising state attorney who was quickly building a reputation as an extremely effective prosecutor. Eugene Berry had come to the practice of law later than most, having earned his law degree a little over five years before he was murdered at age 47. But those were five very productive years, with Berry having tried 30 major cases and gaining an impressive 27 convictions. A number of those cases were related to the thriving drug smuggling business in the Port Charlotte area of Florida. And one of his most recent successes at that time was the conviction of Mike Kelly. With Kelly facing years in prison, Barry and other prosecutors now had leverage over him. Back in Lexington, Kentucky, Bonnie Kelly's main concern was how to free her husband. And for help, she turned to one of the key members of the Mid-Kentucky smuggling organization, Henry Vance. Vance and the Kellys had a history of committing relatively minor crimes involving weapons and drugs, including during the time Henry Vance was serving as a deputy in the Fayette County Sheriff's Office. Just as Drew Thornton was suspected of keeping confiscated drugs that were supposed to be turned in as evidence, so too was Henry Vance. Vance had access to an evidence storage room at the county courthouse and was suspected of stealing both drugs and guns from the room. After Vance's short-lived law enforcement career, he made his way up to the highest levels of state government, serving as a legislative assistant in the Kentucky State House and as assistant to the then-governor, Julian Carroll. It should be noted that there is no evidence that anyone in the legislature or the governor's office in Frankfurt was ever aware of Henry Vance's double life as a member of the drug smuggling operation headquartered in nearby Lexington. There are competing stories as to how Bonnie Kelly ended up at the home of Eugene Berry on the evening of January 16, 1982. She has maintained that she was recruited to travel to kill Berry by Henry Vance, who supplied her with both an untraceable weapon and an alibi. In his own trial on related charges years later, Vance denied any responsibility. But even though an accomplice who took part in the killing in Florida did little to clear up who initiated the plot, he also clearly implicated Vance. According to testimony and evidence presented in her trial, with the gun provided by Henry Vance, Bonnie Kelly appeared at Eugene Berry's front door and rang the bell just after Berry had sat down to watch TV and when his wife Trudy had begun to study for a college course she was taking. Trudy Berry testified in Bonnie Kelly's trial that her husband went to answer the door and she heard him say, Hi, how are you? And then heard the first of several shots. Before she went to him, Trudy Berry immediately phoned for help. 
Then she went to comfort her husband, who, though still breathing, didn't respond. He soon died as a woman in a jogging suit. A woman unseen by Trudy Berry made her way to the car of her accomplice, who served as the getaway driver. As they left the scene, Bonnie Kelly said she followed the advice of Henry Vance and threw the gun into water as she and her driver passed over a bridge. Bonnie Kelly and her accomplice were later arrested, and she refused to implicate anyone else in the murder. Sentenced to life in prison, she continued to remain silent about Henry Vance's involvement in the plot to murder Eugene Berry until the intervention of an FBI special agent, one we met in an earlier episode. That special agent, Jim Huggins of Louisville, now retired. It was no secret that Huggins and many others considered Henry Vance a prime suspect as a co-conspirator in the murder. But they knew that without the help of Bonnie Kelly, they wouldn't have enough evidence to go for a murder charge, much less a conviction. And with the statute of limitations clock quickly running out in 1987, Huggins decided to roll the dice and go to Florida to see if he could convince Bonnie Kelly to give them the details they needed to charge Henry Vance. Traveling to a prison in Florida along with another agent, Huggins' last-ditch effort to get incriminating information from Bonnie Kelly on Henry Vance plays as if from a popular TV show. That case came to my attention when I was still in Louisville as a supervisor on the organized crime squad. I was, it happened about five years earlier. And I noticed it. I started reviewing files, and uh, I knew I'd read all about that when it was going on. It was worked by the uh, local police in Florida and in Lexington, and they they solved the case, you know, very quick. They f- found out it was Bonnie Kelly, and they ended up arresting her and subsequently convicted her of murder, and she went to prison for life. But I noticed in reviewing the file that no one had from up here had ever interviewed Bonnie Kelly to see if she would cooperate and see who ordered the killing or how that all came about. So I decided that myself and another agent, Bill Welch, would travel down to Florida where she was incarcerated and interview her and see if she would cooperate with us. And we contacted the local authorities in Florida and told them what we wanted to do. And they were saying, well, she's not going to talk to you because we've tried to talk to her and she won't talk to anybody in law enforcement. She's just going to do her time and she's trying to forget this whole thing. So don't you're probably wasting your time coming down. I thought, well, we wasted it doing other stuff, so it might be worth a shot. So <clears throat> Bill Welch and I flew down to Florida went out unannounced to the uh, prison where Bonnie was. At that time, it was in Pembroke Pines, in the suburb of Fort Lauderdale, and went in and told them, uh, the person at the desk, we were FBI agents, would like to talk to Bonnie Kelly. And the lady said, well, she, she won't talk to you. She won't talk to anybody from law enforcement. I said, well, can you just tell her we're here and ask her? And she said, well, let me see. So she went back, came back out and said, no, she doesn't want to talk to you. I said, well, tell her we're not from the local Miami office. We're from Lexington. And she comes back out, and she says, she said she she would talk to you for a minute. So I thought it was just curiosity on her part to see what we wanted, being from Lexington. So we go in and told her basically that we were uh, following up on the murder case to see who else was involved because we thought there was more than just Bonnie. And she said she didn't want to talk about it anymore. She'd come. It's been five years since it happened. She'd kind of come to grips with what she'd done. Was very sorry it had happened, and she just wanted to put the whole thing behind her. And I told her, well, I certainly could understand that, but would appreciate it if she could tell us what she knows about other people because they need to be dealt with too, and it's something that's serious. And she said, well, I don't think I'll talk to you, but you know, uh, I appreciate what you're trying to do. And she was very friendly and was not antagonistic at all. So I just said, well, if you change your mind, <clears throat> here's my card. We're staying out of here at a motel in Fort Lauderdale, and we're flying back tomorrow. So if you change your mind, give us a call, not thinking that she would. And the, got back to the motel that evening. She called and said, I've decided I want to talk to you. So we went back out the next day, and she told, laid out the entire situation, that mainly that Henry Vance had furnished the murder weapon to her and told her, how to shoot the the person, and how to dispose of the weapon. And she claimed that he told her to throw it in a a stream with salt water and it would obliterate the serial number, which she did. And then uh, 
we're running out of time because the statute of limitations is five years, and we were right down to like a, a month before. So we decided we we're going to have to f- find that murder weapon to corroborate her testimony. So I contacted a, a man on the Ohio River that runs a had a big magnet, electromagnet, and he'd found a weapon for me at one time on a murder case we worked up in Covington. So I called him and asked him if he could do that, and he said, "Yeah, I could. I could try." He said, it, "It'll cost you those. You know, I have to transport that magnet down to South Florida." And I said, "Well, the bureau will probably pay for it, not dreaming that they would." So I called the FBI headquarters, and luckily got a friend of mine up there in the in the unit that made the approvals and told him. And my my agent in charge in Louisville was was very supportive of it. So we convinced the FBI that it'd be worth ten thousand dollars is what he charged. To at least we had to try, and um, all he said to me is, "You better find it." So we take this, we go down to Florida, and probably one of the most unbelievable things I've, I've in my whole career <laughs> I saw. Never dreaming we'd find that weapon because it was in a and Bonnie and me on our first visit with her, we took her out of custody one day when there with uh, security, and we traveled the route exactly that she did the night of the murder. And she took us up I-75 to this one little bridge, and she th- said, I think this is a place. And she described the tree that was kind of hanging over the water that night. She remembered the moon casting a shadow out on the, on the water and said, I think this is where I dropped it, right over the side. And this was a real muddy, brackish-type stream, salt water. So we come down a couple weeks later with the magnet, right where she showed us. The magnet goes over the side. This is a huge thing. And it goes down to the stream. It's bubbling up all this debris. And as they lift the magnet out, the shell of the gun is attached right to the bottom of that magnet, which we both were astounded. We got we got the weapon, sent it back to the FBI lab. They restored the serial number, and they traced it to Smith & Wesson, where it was manufactured, went to Smith and West, and they had the records of their first sale was to a, a sporting goods store in Dayton, Ohio. We went to the records there, and that showed that it was sold to a man, a man in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, and we tried to run him down. And Henry Vance had told Bonnie that he bought this gun from a man at a flea market in Mount Sterling. So we tracked the, the man down, and he had, he had passed away at the time. But we had, we thought, enough evidence then to get an indictment with, uh, with for Henry Vance transporting the weapon, causing the weapon to be transported in interstate commerce to be used in a murder was the violation. Two days later, we appeared before the federal grand jury. Bonnie, we brought her back up here, and uh, she testified at the grand jury, and they came back with an indictment of Vance two days before the statute of limitations ran. So that was, uh, that was an absolute miracle. <laughs> it was a real highlight mainly to get this guy who had set up this whole murder because of Bonnie's husband was uh, in prison down there on another charge. And they the people up here were afraid that he was going to testify against Henry and Canaan Thornton and the whole group. Of course, Thornton had passed away at that time, but uh, they were afraid. They were running scared then that her husband was going to blow the whistle on him. And uh, turns out she was able to get to him first. A great irony in the case of the death of Eugene Berry at the hand of Bonnie Kelly is that later, Kelly's husband Mike was freed on an appeal and walked out of prison. With her still behind bars, Mike and Bonnie divorced, and years later, Mike Kelly died of an illness. Eugene Berry was honored with a memorial award that is given in his name to a state attorney each year. His wife Trudy finished her studies and earned an undergraduate degree and later a law degree. Then Trudy Berry followed her husband's career choice by becoming an assistant state attorney herself. Given the opportunity, Bonnie Kelly declined to be interviewed for this episode and is currently incarcerated at a Florida state prison. Though technically not sentenced to life without parole, at her most recent parole hearing in August of 2017, it was ruled that she wouldn't be eligible for release until April 28, 2059. Should she live until then, at that time, Bonnie Kelly would be 108 years old and will have spent 74 years in prison for the murder of Eugene Berry. And Henry Vance? He was sentenced to 15 years and served nearly 10 years of that before being paroled. After his release from prison, he decided to buy a home in a nice, quiet neighborhood in Frankfort, Kentucky, 
where he would walk his dog. By that time, it was reported that Vance was losing his vision, and as he would pass by a home just a few blocks from his own, and still had sight remaining to see someone working in their own yard, he would call out, Hey neighbor, never realizing that he had moved just a few houses away from the man whose work had barely beaten the statute of limitations, a man who had earlier retired at the same neighborhood, a man more responsible than anyone else for putting Henry Vance in prison, his new neighbor, FBI Special Agent Jim Huggins. In our next episode, we will conclude the story of pilot Drew Thornton, following along on his flight on the night he jumped to his death. Fly by Night is brought to you by Midnight Flyer Media. Theme music is Darker by Hendrik Anderson with additional music by Abe Stites. Show art is by Aini with additional design by Abe Stites. The show is produced and hosted by Charles Stites with editing by Abe Stites and additional mixing and audio support by Resonate Recordings. If you like what you hear, please leave a rating and a review and subscribe to Fly by Night wherever you get your podcasts. And for photos and more on the key players in each episode, visit flybynightpodcast.com.